parlance on that. Because I'm talking uh, military parlance, I tend to swear, uh, and I tend to use a lot of acronyms that I should. So I can try and prevent both of those from happening. Oh, okay. I'll ask you. Don't worry. Uh, I'm a good civilian there. So, um, sound just got turned on, so okay. no more swearing. Uh, <laughs> uh, <coughs> are you ready to go? Yep. Okay. Um, I'll get on camera. <coughs> so, uh, hi everyone. My name is uh, Joe Shaheen. I'm a PhD student here in the department. Uh, I've been asked to introduce Tom uh, since uh, most of our faculty members are at either uh, conferences or meetings for today. So Tom is going to tell us about complex intelligence preparation for the battlefield, uh, and he's going to tell us all kind of neat things about intel stuff, wow. right? I think I'll be saying that. So uh, whenever you're ready, take it away. All right, thank you. Thanks, Joe. All right, uh, so my name is Tom Pike. In my day job, I'm a lieutenant colonel in the Army. However, I must emphasize that the views expressed in this presentation do not reflect the views of the U.S. government, Department of Defense, or the U.S. Army. Uh, this briefing was actually originally given at the International Studies Association back in February. That and the associated paper uh, were cleared for public release uh, through the appropriate authorities. All right, so. Um, uh, and also the person, Dr. Peter M. Zagorowski, is also uh, a first lieutenant in the Army, uh, currently in Germany. He, uh, he graduated just recently from his PhD in Claremont Graduate University, uh, and so we both kind of co-presented uh, at ISA um, there, and potentially he is, he is uh, watching from Germany right now on the YouTube channel, Joe. Yeah. So, all right, so the first thing to say is, is kind of from uh, an analytic perspective, uh, my contention, again, my personal views, uh, uh, is that really when you're, you're trying to do analysis of a complex fo uh, foreign problem, uh, you hu you're heuristically kind of searching for information as a method of analysis. Uh, actually, for people that have done it for years and years, they're very good at it. Uh, and even so, the best models uh, have a hard time uh, kind of competing with them as for accuracy uh, uh, based on some of the political science models and stuff that, that they've done on tests. However, uh, well, and so it added to that decision makers want simple plain language. Most of the time you're making decisions, you have to make a decision uh, uh, and, and people using, you know, heterogeneity versus diversity uh, doesn't necessarily oppress decision makers when they're just trying to get boiled down the problem set to the key components so they can make a, a, a decision uh, in pursuit of some type of uh, foreign policy objective. All right, this implicitly does not uh, incentivize learning or applying advanced theories because if you start using that language, uh, it, it usually just causes more, more, more problems than, than not. All right, uh, analytic training often becomes a course in writing or presenting. Uh, this kind of goes back to the idea is you can, have the bet, you can be the smartest person in the world, right? but if you're unable to effectively communicate that idea, all right, it, it, it doesn't, you're not going to get it, a decision maker is not going to want to hear it. All right, so, uh, so really uh, the crucial uh, kind of keystone of all this is if you can't effectively write it out or you can't effectively present it, it doesn't matter how good the analysis is or how rigorous it is underneath it. All right, you have to be able to communicate it so a diverse audience from potentially various different elements of the U.S. government, particularly talking like USAID or State Department, can actually understand what you're talking about and have a, a coherent, develop a coherent strategy to do that. All right, in addition, uh, I mean, it's, it's always busy, right? The, so the operational temple makes learning and applying new theories difficult. So not only learning it, but then keeping up with, you know, the academics, the vast uh, academic environment that we have in the U.S. Or, or across the world and trying to maintain an understanding of those theories and how they're advancing and, and who's finding out a flaw in somebody else's theory, right? So all these problems make it difficult for anybody trying to do analysis to understand something to stay up on, you know, what's the newest and greatest academic theory and how do we understand it? All right, and then apply it to, to make better decisions. All right, so the vision all right, and in this case, I was talking like a PhD student, I'm kind of talking uh, more my, with my officer hat on, is how can we democratize these agent-based models so analysts across the intelligence community can explore their understanding of the complex phenomenon of interest? All right, and then how can models become an option exploration tool for decision makers would kind of be the second tool of that. So you have a, uh, a tool, a, uh, a model that you've kind of tweaked and you've explored and you said, hey, these seem to be the real factors that are making, that are causing the emergent behavior over here. Let's say uh, making this country susceptible to terrorism, uh, making uh, the, uh, an insurgency more appealing than the actual government, all right? 
Uh, and then from that, can you use that with decision makers to kind of explore, well, we have these small limited sets in our toolkit. All right, how can we apply, how can we leverage those for the, and get the most bang for a buck, right? the most cost effective use of them uh, in, in order to you know, increase stability, for example. All right, so the key point here, which I think I, in my own experience in the Army, I think uh, is often mix, missed uh, when uh, we, we spend lots of money to get researchers out there, is that the point is to get models that enable understanding for, you know, for the workers, those discussions, right, and more effectively, uh, more effectively integrate proven theories, right. So it's not about giving them answers, right. It's about providing models that enable their understanding, right. So this becomes like the say the big idea uh, one. All right, this is actually the big idea. That one's kind of a little idea. All right, um, but the idea is, can we get models to bridge to serve as a, a technological bridge between academic theories? All right, and the analysis. All right, uh, and so the idea would be that, you know, so much like you use Windows or Apple or whatever it is, you got your application, all right, uh, and you, you've got an interface that you're familiar with and can integrate, and all the time new updates are coming out, you're going through, you know, your different versions. All right, what that would be in this sense is, hey, you know, another group within this you know, ecosystem that I need to be created that say, hey, this theory is, is proving some usefulness. All right, let's integrate this into the coding. All right, and so for the, the people kind of, uh, you know, looking at the problem set every day, they're just getting updates, but in reality, the, the modeling is becoming more and more effective for the model or suite of models that they're using to try and understand whatever problem set that they're looking at. All right, uh, it would be, uh, then you'd have to use open source. This is kind of big data, right? It's very, very popular right now, right? But use these open source data sets to enhance inputs or validate model results. All right, so uh, for example, the IQs, Integrated Conflict Early Warning uh, System, all right, which you can get off Harvard Dataverse, all right, uh, and that gives you event data all right, from, uh, that is pulling from, from newspapers across the world. All right, you can say, hey, are we getting the same uh, uh, amounts of cooperation and conflict that we're seeing all right, uh, uh, in the real world compared with what we're getting in our model? All right, uh, and then you know what other open you know open source data sets, particularly if you're doing like USAID projects, all right, and the other kind of arms of the of the U.S. government, all right, that are that are working in cooperation, uh, you know, with host nations, all right, you know, can they can they provide that data set to help them, you know, to work with the host nation, uh, provide better models that are more accurate that they can feed into it, so the analyst isn't trying to guess. Hey, what should I put in this input for how many people are part of this organization or not? The other thing I'd add to this is, is it seems, since using this to understand it, it seems kind of open secrets, so to speak, are more uh, valuable uh, than what would be could just traditionally called secrets, right? So it's more the fact like, hey, your citizenship in North African countries was used to control how the government uh, gave out its patronage to people that it kept it in power, all right? Um, so. Uh, so we use the open source to both help calibrate the model, but also validate it to make sure as a check to be like, hey, is this actually, we think it's working, be, we think this is happening because of these factors, and then you have some, some hard data sources to compare against that to make sure it's working. All right, the other thing I would contend is that this would, you could create a feedback loop between the research and academic community and, and those, are the, those people that are practicing. Right, so it'd be, hey, we're working, you know, we're using this model, this suite of models, this, this one seems to do much better, all right, and then they can look at the theory underneath that and say, well, why is that? What theory is underneath that? Uh, as, as you'll see uh, in the model I'm gonna show, it uses cooperative game theory, right? Uh, and that literature is incredibly deep, I'm learning. All right, so it's which, you know, which one is both maybe computationally the most efficient, all right, but which one might have uh, a little bit better understanding of the nuances as those theories kind of compete out, all right? As well as it could give those researchers some more under, uh, some more data to deal with, with these really hard problems that, that have, they've typically avoided because it's just, they're just too hard, all right? So how do we do this? All right, uh, I actually start with the bottom point here where, where my, my underlying contention of all this is that you need an ecosystem, right? You need an ecosystem to develop it 
Uh, so you need, you got people applying it, the analysts. You would need, uh, you know, the, the coders and social scientists uh, underneath it that are saying, hey, well, let's try and do this theory or let's build this variation of the, the model. And they'd have to have ties with the researchers in academia who are saying, hey, no, this idea is really good. You should try it out. You know, this is, this is where it's been validated. All right, so having that, that kind of nucleus of interdependencies, I would say, is, is the most critical point. So, you know, you don't want to give them, you know, the Google virtual reality goggles where they're playing all sorts of cool video games. It's like, what's the, can we create just the version of Pong, if you all remember that, right? Like, a, I believe Atari's first video game, right? What's that version of Pong that we could put out there to, to essentially kind of bring to life this ecosystem, right? And then, uh, and then, uh, and then start to get it growing on its own, all right? And so then uh, to kind of provide that catalyst, or at least for the part, a model that analysts might use, uh, is we're gonna adapt a, a current DOD analytic framework called IPB, or Intelligence Preparation of the Battlefield. All right, uh, and the idea from that is, you know, as we learn from complex system, law, complex adaptive systems theory, long-term dependencies matter. All right, and I've, as I've learned, you know, kind of talking about these ideas for about, uh, about seven years now, uh, is that there's a, it's very difficult to get people to understand completely new theories. It's much easier to get them to evolve from what they already understand. So what we did is we took uh, IPB, uh, made some tweaks to it to try and get a more complexity-based approach so it becomes a meta framework that you can put a model underneath. All right? um, and, then the, and then this kind of goes back to the, the kind of key idea that I'll probably keep harping on. All right, is that the goal is to have uh, a model that allows analysts to grow their phenomena of interest, right? So to, to quote Epstein, right? If you didn't grow it, you didn't understand it, all right? Uh, is, you know, can they sit there and say, well, we think this is what really matters, you know, in, in country X, and this is why they had, you know, uh, a revolt, all right? Can they recreate that based off what they're saying matters, right? So now they've added a little bit more rigor versus just, well, I've been doing this for 20 years and I got these sources to back it up. All right, so all right, uh, the key to that though, I'd say is, you know, it's gotta be an intuitive graph graphic user interface or GUI, all right, it's gotta be able to sell itself. This only works if analysts go, all right, so if we create, if we give them the model and, and experienced analysts will like go to it before they go into a presentation to a decision maker or before they, you know, uh, uh, write, a, write a, uh, an article about it and say, well, you know, I go to it just because I want to make sure it provides me more confidence in what I'm saying and really helps me you know, better understand what's going on. All right. All right. And then, so what is intelligence preparation of the battlefield? It's an analog process that was developed in the 70s. All right. Uh, it was designed for force on force fighting. This becomes kind of critical when we go to the next slide. All right. Uh, since I spent, you know, I came in the Army in 2000, right? In 2001, you had 9 11. So, so most of my time in the Army has been uh, fighting counterinsurgency and terrorists. All right, so it's a, it, it wasn't designed for this. But, but why this continues to be kind of a cornerstone of the analysis is that it as, assumes a high casualty, right? right? You take Dr. Chaffee's record setting uh, events for theory, we should have a 22.5 million uh, casual, battle casualties in, in the next major war. All right, that, that, that is a huge uh, factor that you can't discount if you have to always be prepared for the contingency of a mass mobilization. All right, so if you have a high casualty rate, how do you train somebody with very little experience becoming a civilian to a soldier, so to speak, all right, uh, where they could go out there and, and help provide a competitive advantage and do some insightful analysis, all right? So, uh, and that's kind of the mentality uh, from behind it. But it really comes down to, to four, four steps, all right? Some people have called uh, this a sacred cow, all right, which is one reason why I try to co-opt it versus fight it, so to speak, all right? I've also heard it called several other things, which I'll refrain from saying. All right, but there's really four steps to it. Define the area of operations, which is to say, this is what we're looking at. This is our problem set, so to speak. Uh, describe the environmental effects. You can look at that as those are your givens, right? You, you're not gonna change the terrain, right? You know, where there's a mountain, you're not gonna make a, a, a four lane highway, all right? Or where there's a river, you're not all, all of a sudden gonna be able to magically produce a bridge, all right? And the weather, right? So far as we, we can't control the weather, right? And start making it raining because we wanna delay an enemy's attack. All right, so those are kind of your givens, all right? And then you evaluate the threat. What, what is it that they actually have? You know, what kind of uh, uh, weaponry do they have? How do they move? You know, what, what, how do they typically fight, all right? And then finally from this, it, it actually gives you a pretty good baseline to say, well, based off these kind of givens, 
All right, they're probably going to do one or two, uh, one of these three things. These are the these are their best options to try and defeat us. All right, uh, if you look at this in the the canonical theory of social complexity, right? This would be in the when the system's changing. This would be your willingness, capability, or uh, capability, willingness, and opportunity, right? So the, the and interesting as I just kind of learned this uh, on Tuesday, we had this discussion. There's a lot of crossover between those two things that wasn't uh, that I found pretty interesting. All right. So then this kind of goes to idea two, which is also the way I'm kind of approaching this, uh, this strategy, right? So IPB is a, is a two entity fight, right? Us versus them, right? We apply it to complex problems. In my opinion, again, my opinion, uh, issues arise, right? This is, this is really based off a lot of my experiences, uh, you know, over the last 17 years. All right, so part of that problem is you ignore most of the attack or most of the problem, right? In counterinsurgency, it's really the population that matters, all right? Or if you're not, in a, right, so I'm kind of playing in my biases here, but or if you're just looking at population, you're not necessarily, you're hopefully not necessarily in a fight. All right, so you only focus on the attacks. You only kind of focus on one part. All right, then it becomes a systems dynamics problem, right, where you look at them as a homogenous whole. Right, it's just the it's they're a whole entity and they're all working together. Which, in my opinion, if you're trying to apply policy, is not a good approach because it's so you got to if you're trying to influence behavior, you got to look for those cracks to influence it. And if they're just a solid entity, that makes it much more difficult to find a successful tactic to do that or, or policy. All right, and then what happens is uh, you get a lot of checklist descriptions where you focus on the different nodes. All right, so the examples I'll kind of use for this is I'll talk about you know, doctors. When I was in Iraq, you know, they, we, they had doctors and we had, I mean, just truly incredible surgeons. Uh, and those surgeons would help train up their doctors and make them even better, right? Uh, but what I would contend is that wasn't necessarily needed, right? What was really needed was, hey, you got a guy who's a fairly decent doctor, right, uh, in these countries, but that person needs a logistic system to, to get them supplies. They need a banking system so they can collect money uh, and make revenue, and they need a legal system so somebody can sue them for malpractice or what have you. All right, so, so having the entity work as a whole really matters, and knowing how those interdependencies come together uh, is really, really becomes the key part, all right, as opposed to, uh, hey, they're, they're really corrupt. This person works in the government. Uh, let's, let's tell them why corruption is bad and use lots of examples, right? And uh, when, I, when I went through a course, I worked with a, a, um, a guy who's a fail for Mali. Uh, if you know the story behind that, we thought it was a huge success story uh, until they had a coup, all right? Uh, and it was because we, we were providing lots of money and, and resources and they were doing really well, except for that the officer corps was pretty much siphoning off all the all the money all right, and the soldiers weren't getting trained as much as kind of being left to their own devices, right? So, uh, so that becomes a, a, a challenge where how do we understand once we're putting energy, if you will, into a system, how is that energy being dispersed and what are the second and third order effects happening from that, all right? And that really becomes idea two is don't focus on the pieces, right? You know, build a nation like, hey, we're going to put a foundation, we're going to put up walls. It's you, you say, hey, these are the key pieces we need, to, we need to be working together, all right? And you make sure that those pieces are working together the, the way that you want them to, to, uh, to have the second and third order effects that, that you feel are, uh, that are desired, all right? So then that goes into how do we put this uh, into complex intelligence preparation of the, of the battlefield, all right? Um, if we put it in, in complexity terms, and, and I'll probably I'll skip over most of that, that's just kind of like the IPB variation, but, but for this side, so the left-hand side, you got, uh, you know, how do we capture the Asian environment interaction? That, right. Yeah, right-hand side, sorry. My other, my other left. So uh, Asian environment interaction, the Asian agent interaction, all right? And then, and then this becomes kind of key in our opinion, which, which really try to capture the model. Uh, and part of the reason we chose the, the, the theories that we did is how are those agents co coalescing into groups and then how are those groups dissolving? Right, and then we kind of say that this is, uh, I guess, idea hasn't been refined, but how's the energy in the system, how is that being processed? So the way I describe it is, if you take uh, sugar escape, right, and instead of just one person, uh, you know, consuming and processing the sugar, it takes, you know, five people, all right, to, you know, refine it, you know, dig it up, refine it, and, and what have you, right, and so they can all consume it. All right, I, w I would contend, uh, and this is, again, I would say at best hypothetical, I would contend that um, 
uh, how they do that gives them a competitive advantage over other groups that are also trying to do that. All right, and that becomes really the core assumption within the model that every action is to increase your fitness function, uh, and people are, are working in groups, right, uh, in one way or another to, to try and do that. Right, they're aligning themselves with, with one group or a different to make themselves more competitive, you know, increase their pay, uh, or or increase their, their particular power in a certain country. All right. Uh, that one, to make sure there's some empirical backing for that, uh, actually for 625, we're using the IQ's data uh, to, to see if cooperation and, and uh, conflict follow the same, uh, follow the same distribution. Yeah. Um, and yes. Are we at the like, strategic or operational or like tactical? So I would, I'm struggling a little bit. Yeah, so, I, would, so I'm, I'm jumping back and forth, but it, I would contend it's, it's scale free. So okay. I would contend if you're at a village uh, in Afghanistan, yeah. right? You're going to have groups fighting with each other over who's in charge and, and whether you know. Hey, I want this guy to be elected judge so I can get back the land that the, you know that person X stole from me 20 years ago, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and, but if you scale that up, it's the same. You know, I'm political party X now. Uh, I disagree with what political party Y is doing. So how can I? You, you know, what options do I have in the environment that I'm in to try and make sure that I'm always in power? Does that make sense? Yeah, so you see, so I mean, democratize, you're, you're talking about like a generalizable type of model where you can, you're taking the IPB and you're looking at group dynamics, agent interaction, yep. and energy in the system, and then you can apply that. You can define your groups in different ways. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, and that, and that becomes, absolutely, that's okay. a great question. That becomes crucial, right? Because it's got to be, uh, you know, whether it's a model or a suite of models, uh, it, it's got to be, is it a tool that aids the analysts on that particular problem set? And, and although we talk about IPB, it's really for kind of what we call left of bang, right before a major conflict, or right of bang afterwards, mm -hmm. right? So it's you know, what's happening beforehand, how do we understand the underlying dynamics to make it predict a little bit better if there's gonna be you know, something like the Arab Spring, right? Or uh, on the other side, how do we you know, create a functioning uh, society afterwards that doesn't descend into, you know, right. Continued civil war. And so you're also dealing with potentially multiple time scales. Yes. So you're longer term, months, days, down yep. to minutes, depending yes. on what you're trying to do. Yeah. Okay. So unequivocally, it is a very lofty goal, right? No. But, well, uh, I mean, you need to start yeah. thinking through these problems in that way, and then, then, so in my experience with modeling in yeah. with the military, you know, and, and to apply these concepts, you, you need to have an understanding of where you are. And then you need to find a community where it can more quickly resonate with, so then you can start applying it to that space. Yep. So I think this is a great approach. Yeah. I just wanted to make sure I was yeah, able to no, say it's, yeah. yeah, I think, and that, yeah, so yeah, uh, absolutely. No, I, I agree with you. And then it's, um, I'm, at this point, I firmly believe that it's like this, it's scale free. Conflict and cooperation are, are scale free, and whether you're a village or a country, the dynamics that people are using are the same. It's just the scale is different. Okay. So, so far, I haven't seen anything to dissuade me from that that notion. And uh, could you say what you mean by population? Um, so, like evaluate population behavior. So, so that that then uh, I would say sort of talks right to that kind of that that aspect of uh, it's more you as the in this case as the analyst. If, if your problem set is, um, I don't want to say anything, it might cause issues, but right, so if your problem set is, is whole of country X, right, that's what you're trying to understand uh, at that level of country X. But if your problem set is village in, you know, country, uh, say Afghanistan, right, then, then you're able to take this and just look at that village and say, you know, uh, which this one I'm more familiar with, right, talk to that, that battalion commander and say, hey, look, this is, these are the key power brokers you got in this village and this is how they're trying to influence you because they're actually trying to get this goal over here right this he really wants control of this resource right so that's why he's gonna tell you that this guy is do you know that this other power broker is doing these things you know so how can we understand those dynamics we're not kind of becoming puppets to to the internal power struggles does that make sense mm -hmm. yeah so all right. All right. So then, what's the model? All right. And just I guess it's not here, but uh, it, last semester, I think Dr. Axel put out the challenge: like, can you use all three uh, of the uh, uh, of the systems uh, or of the power of the projectors? So uh, I, I'm using all three of the projectors since it was a challenge, and I have some kind of weird neurosis neuroses where I have to stay, try and uh, engage the challenge. 
Uh, but the model, right, uh, it's initial test. So this is actually uh, on stability, right? So now I got put on another head, right? So I've gone from, hey, as, as somebody, I guess, who's kind of like a mid-level manager, right? this is how I would, would describe a solution to create uh, an organization that, that could use this. Now I put on my, you know, I'm a student in a PhD program. Uh, I'm working on a dissertation. All right, uh, how do I create a model that could be, you know, as a point said earlier, the pong to do this? All right, um, and so the initial test is actually a stability. It was initially instantiated in that logo. As I'm learning in 610, that logo is very, uh, as I learned Wednesday, uh, it seems very popular with political scientists. Um, all right, and there's three sec sequential submodels in here. So the first one is a community bar uh, bargaining organization module, uses cooperative game theory. And this is the idea of you have agents. How do they coalesce into, into a group, right? What's what dynamics are causing them to coalesce into a group or having that group dissolve, all right? Uh, the second was a stakeholder bargaining module. So th this is not cooperative game theory. And this is now that you have these groups, right? How are, they, how, are they, uh, how are they competing in order to try and accomplish whatever their goal is, right? And the final one is, uh, is conflict, uh, conflict onset theory, uh, which you use and in this case when I run it, uh, it gives a little exclamation marks to show you that a, a conflict er, uh, erupted. All right, I can go to, to more details. Uh, what this is based off of, uh, uh, or a lot of this, what it's based off of is if you look in uh, 2015 Jazz, it's an article called Sempro. All right, and so that was the, the group out of Claremont, the political science department, and they used it for power transition lines, uh, power, high power transmission lines sitting all right, in California. Uh, uh, and, it, I, and they actually used uh, GIS data uh, to, to model it because they're trying to advise the power companies, hey, they got to put through a new transmission line. Uh, how do we go about doing this uh, in order to, uh, uh, and so we could be successful in spending, instead of spending a bunch of money trying to convince people, coming up with plans, uh, and then the, the local city or county voting it down because there was a, you know, a local uprising uh, uh, of people saying, we don't want this behind our house. Uh, and from what I understand, it, it came up with pretty, pretty good results. Uh, so that's really kind of the core of the model. Uh, Zagorowski then used it uh, for, uh, uh, to look at climate variability and, it, and its influence uh, on uh, um, climate variability and its influence on, on conflict. All right, so he, he finished his dissertation on that, is, is now uh, looking to get published. All right, um, so the next steps. All right, we're instantiating Python, doing that right now in 610. That's proving an exciting adventure going from uh, NetLogo into Python. All right, um, and then you know, val val validate and iterate. So the first kind of thing we're looking at doing is, uh, right now this one looks at, all right, so you can have groups, uh, which you can see over there, I guess. Um, uh, so party number, right, you can change the number of parties in there, but the challenge is all those parties are homogenous. All right, uh, so it's, you have five parties that all have the same wealth distribution and ideology distribution. All right, so uh, now I want to put more parties in there where you can set their ideology and, uh, and wealth distribution, you know, based off, uh, you know, based off whatever. All right, uh, that's where NetLogo becomes problematic because if you did that for every party, you need a new set of sliders. All right, in Python, we can have a, you know, a whole interface that pops up just for the inputs and one for the outputs. Uh, so, so we got to make that transition anyways. All right, and then, you know, can we, but I think the next one we're looking at, uh, which I'm looking at, which will become important here in a second because you can help me brainstorm for dissertation ideas, all right, uh, is you know, how can you bring in big data, right? The IQs to, to populate it and test it or, or what have you. How can you bring in open source stuff to, to help you understand it better? All right, so on to this one. All right, so if you look over on the right screen, and for those of you watching online, sorry. All right, but it's, we won't spend too much time on this. All right, uh, but the, so here you got the government base, that's kind of like their base wealth of income, right? Um, this helps determine the wealth of the population. That's the government ideology. So government ideology is like from zero to 100. Um, and it's not good or bad. It's just kind of like if you look at a political spectrum, uh, 10 is on the one side, 100 is on the other side. So it's just how far apart you are, so to speak, right? Taxes is how much they tax the, tax the population, uh, party number. Uh, just a number of different groups that are out there. Selector rate, uh, those are the people that are government stakeholders. Uh, if you're familiar with selector theory, that's another political theory, science theory. All right, that says the government's kind of giving you, you're a client of the government and you kind of get money. Yeah. Um, so 
Right, so Talkspin uh, is an interesting concept, but, but they've, I guess, uh, I'll say Zagorowski had a look at this in, when I ran, uh, potentially had a revolution and why it didn't occur, right? And, and this became a critical factor. And the idea is social media will only take you so far, but uh, to a certain point, it's how far you can interact with people. So this is, this is their distance of, for kind of personal interaction. Um, and there's some papers on that, right? So uh, power parity. Uh, that's a, that's how much power you need before. So this is, goes to the conflict onset. That's how much power you need before you're gonna you're willing to rise up. All right. Um, this is just the ideology of the population. All right. Uh, it's spread over a normal distribution, but you can skew it here with a standard deviation. All right, as you can see here. All right. And then citizen wealth. That's kind of the same thing. All right. Uh, it's it's uh, normally distributed over the population, but you can skew it as I did here. All right. And then I'll just show you it running. They should, a war should erupt or a conflict should erupt. So you can see, so the little, the little, uh, the little links being created, uh, there's, and there's your conflict. All right, so the little links being created, I'll run it again. That's your talk spam where people are forming their, their CBOs. Um, the, the big links, or that's your stakeholder bargaining, uh, where, where they're kind of co uh, interacting with each other, I'll say. Right? Uh, and then it, it's because it's uh, designed to kind of focus on stability. Uh, once the conflict sto uh, starts, it, it stops. Okay. Any questions on that? Concerns? That is? All right. So with that, that kind of. All right. So my question is, right? So I'm not trying to get free, get free services from all of you, uh, or free help. Is I'm really, my question is, right? So I, you're trying to make this a catalyst to say, hey, here's the idea. Here's here's a tool that's impressive enough. They say, hey, that's good enough. We'll give it a try. All right. So right now, my two big questions in my own mind, which might not be the best questions, are you know what are the what's the best inputs you know you'd think for a, for for somebody looking at this, whether USAID or whatever. All right. And then what are the best or what is the best development options? Where should we focus the efforts in order to do it? So. Can you so before we get to the brainstorm, I want to understand a little better what what are we getting <coughs> out of this particular model here. I mean, what is this telling me when I run this and change how quickly a, 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 a conflict arises, who the conflict is between, uh, what, what is the significance of this conflict? Uh, okay. So, so hypothetically, right? Because right, we just say you need to create a toy model as a base and then kind of iterate, gotcha. uh, iterate from that. It, it would be, uh, say you're looking at country Z, uh -huh. right? And, and you know, uh, you know roughly how the country's organized, I and mean, so you're based off, uh, uh, you're based off how the wealth's distributed, uh, how much of the the people are invested in the government's success or not. All right, uh, then you so based off that you could say, well, I think they're about here. Then you can look at it and say, well, only under these conditions would we actually see uh, violence erupt. Right. So so the the challenge is it doesn't give you like I mean, you got a lot of sliders, but it doesn't give you a lot of variety if you're trying to understand whether or not a, a country is going to go into revolt or not uh, you know I, I would contend most analysts would feel frustrated with this mm -hmm. so, so this became just kind of like the first step uh, as a base to say okay we need uh, you know groups coalescing we need you know uh, the ability to see conflict right? so we got that so now we're trying to go to the next step which is uh, how can we add uh, more inputs from the analysts that, that will give them that sense that, hey, yeah, yes, I would be curious about these things and putting it in here makes me feel like I'm exploring how that population is, is doing better. And within this model, what is the reason for groups coalescing and then dissolving? Um, so it's, uh, in this case, it's, uh, it's pretty much wealth and power, uh -huh. right? So uh, depend uh, how much wealth they have and how much power they have, and then it's relative to everybody else in the population. All right, in so the in their specific there's area. Greater discrepancy between yep. wealth and power. Then there's a uh, some group tries to write that and make it more equal or shared. Yeah, well, they, yeah. So then they try and rise up against the authority. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and so again, that, that is you know, it's, uh, before I said it, it's not like this, but some other theories where they've applied this with, with fairly good, fairly good results. So, right, but again, the cooperation game theory is very deep. 
right? And this is, for lack of better scripture, why I'm arguing is it's easier just to punt, right? Mm -hmm. I don't need to dis decide, so to speak, to see which ones work better when you when you hand it out to the masses. So my first thought uh, with your inputs there, mm -hmm. um, I think you're going to want to not just have wealth as something that is what they fight over, but also territory space yep. that has wealth inside of it, um, because that becomes a, a focus. Um, so I think, and, and that's also a major benefit of these kinds of models, is that you can you can explicitly show space and you have space as a dynamic that, that people fight over, act in, and um, can limit um, the ability of, of groups to communicate or cooperate. Yeah. No, that's concerned. That's one thing we uh, I know with the SEMPRO is using GIS add-ins, mm -hmm. uh, and, and so I think yeah that'd be critical as you got it in there particularly, and then you can combine them too, right? It's like hey, what are the major revenue producers in the in this space? Right. So don't be shy. I'm I'm shameless and never think I'm right. So so yeah. what I see there, if I count it right, is somewhere on the order of ten inputs already. Yes. And so is question one. What are the inputs in addition to those ten? Well, yeah. Or what of those ten should you down select to? Because that's a fairly ambitious dissertation yeah. right there. Yeah. So okay. Yeah. No. And that's where. Uh, so th so I guess that that goes to the larger question of, I don't necessarily want to fight over the 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 nuts and bolts in the model. Right, uh, I can I can make a model, but is there a way to spin the dissertation so it's more about the uh, user inputs into it? Does that make sense? More, not the values of the user inputs, but can the user can you build a model that the user can propose an input like well, was just proposed yeah. so and get it yeah. added to the model? Well, that's it. Uh, I, that would be an ideal. I don't know if I'm that good there. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's that's but that's it, a challenge. I, yeah. I think you may want to consider because yeah. the, you get into this quite. This gets to the inputs. There are a lot of inputs that could sure. go into yeah. this model, yeah. depending the scales and, and and all of that. So, I think what you need to do is is think about a case study that would best kind of bring up the advantages of this type of approach. Um, yeah. And then once you have your case study, then you can narrow down your variables. And you will find that in any case study, certain variables are going to be common. There will be some level of a wealth factor, but what that wealth is may be land resources, it may be monetary resources, it may be, uh, I don't know, cultural resources. I'm just making some stuff up here. Yeah. But um, So I think you need, to, you need to come up with a case study that grounds your model so that people can understand what you're doing at different levels. Right. And the other thing I would think about too is, is there a, so you're, you're combining three game theory approaches. That's a lot. Um, and I think you want to have a hook that invites people in the military community to be interested in that game theory. Is there one that's very popular right now that you want to challenge? and compare those two or, or make better. Um, the problem is that you're gonna get you're gonna get too much into the lots of game theory ideas. Yeah. But well it's a so uh, so I'm a little concerned about uh, that. But now when you come to a case study that may the right type of game theoretic may fall out of your case study. Right. Yeah, I think that kind of speaks to before you answer and yeah. your comments are echoed by someone from our Online stream. Oh, excellent. Yeah, so I mean, that goes to the, all right, for the dissertation, I gotta, gotta narrow it down, do one specific stuff to pass my, uh, you know, pass my, pass, I guess, get my PhD. Uh, but the other challenge, though, becomes uh, if we, we now scope it back out, uh, I don't know if there's another way to do it besides growing it from something small to something larger, right? So, you know, my, my end state, right? The only reason I, I would say the only reason, but Kind of one of the primary reasons I did this was to get the technical expertise to propose something, you know, that, that you know, can be small and scaled down. But I, I want to keep in mind this, the next step, which is, well, what would it look, you know, what would this look like to kind of operationalize it and push, you know, to 
have something that could be pushed out to, to lots of different groups. <coughs> but I, I guess Sorry. do you have any, any thoughts on how that could be a suite of models? So Tom, part of this is the small models are oftentimes used to produce the emergent behavior that you might expect. Yeah. When you can produce basics or fundamentals of the emergent behavior, then you can come back and say, well, I know that this rule set, this collection of rules or behaviors, produced my emergent behavior that I'm interested in. Now I'm going to add scale and complexity so that I can produce more of my emergent behaviors uh, at the same time, right? And you expand both, so you, you're expanding both in scale and in breadth of the model. So your model has to produce something in terms of an emergent behavior that you might expect in revolutions or rebellions or whatever. That first, you've already observed. That you've already observed in real life from data or from at least at least qualitative observations. Yes. And then you can you can be satisfied that your small model works to a certain extent. Then you can build on it breadth yes. and yeah. uh, and scale. The the second thing that I would uh, that I would argue is uh, I love focusing on method as well, but method doesn't sell. Right? Yeah. It just, it just, it, I don't know why. Apparently, the academic community seems to believe that methods are not important unless they are attached to cases. Whether that's, you know, the right, right way to do it or, or not is another question. But if you wanted to get this uh, published, you'll have to do the same BS that I have to do, which is to find a case yeah. that is directly applicable to your, so a country or a, or a theater of war or something where, 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 where this will work. Well, and this yeah. gets to validation. Yeah. which is something you want to think about with your model, it's really critical that you have some strategy for validation, even in toy models, yeah. and, toy models, yeah. right? And, yeah. and, and your case study, you may choose a, a, a case, an example, a problem set, because you know you have data to help you validate the model. Uh, yeah, and, um, and, and maybe this time, maybe I should focus on that a little bit more, but you know, my master's, I did a, a, a lot of political science uh, type stuff. Uh, and, and so I know there's a kind of a robust literature out there for that with associated case studies. So I'm, I'm confident in that sense that I could use these theories and say, oh, okay, this works pretty good, but then it all goes back to the point of, uh, you know, what can, uh, uh, you know, once you get that, is it good enough that uh, somebody who's not concerned about dissertations, not concerned about publication says, uh, you know, hey, I'm an analyst, or you know, hey, I'm in USAID and in, in and I, I, you know, this would actually help me understand, uh, you know, what's happening here, right? This would, well, I think, this is it. But if I put, you know, with those inputs, let me let me I give you an example that. of what I'm thinking. Yeah. You could potentially look at is you, you, one of the things that you seem to be really interested in here is being able to scale up your model. So what you could do is take a case study of a very local conflict that you see scales up to global issues. So um, looking at um, a, a territorial battle um, in, um, okay, so, so a territorial battle in Afghanistan over poppy fields may scale up to, you know, the, the big, the great game between Russia and, and the US and Britain and whoever else is currently playing. Um, and and you, could, you could scale that up on probably three levels, one being the local, Tri tribes and villages to the um, you know Afghanistan state government level to, to the superpower level um, or, or not so within Afghanistan you're talking about regional powers yeah. if they're provinces that, that play the games from the warlords and so then you have three scales you have the same problem set so potentially the same input of data and then you can show how this kind of model if it works you know, scales up to those different levels and provides some intelligence. No, it's good. Yeah. There is um, enough feedback with you all. So in terms of inputs, so I, I understand what you're saying with, uh, with inputs, like um, you're thinking about it, I think abstract, you're thinking, look, this set of inputs should give us this kind of outputs for this kind of model, and this is why this model could be used. Is that, what were you saying about well, inputs being the, kind of so universal? I think, okay, you know, what Dr. Dr. Comer said, the idea would be, hey, I gotta, I think this factor is valuable and I could put it in there, right? But but I think that's probably too much of a pipe dream right now. I so, agree. So, I, agree. Uh, I think that's too ambitious. Yeah, so, well, I mean, just, a, but so what, I guess how, how can I move just a little bit further down that road? You know, provide the next, the next, you know, get that light shining a so, little bit further. So, but, but there are, you know, if you make the model simple enough to where you can only require 
two or three inputs at a time. You can legislate, right? You can legislate the kinds of uh, inputs one or two at a time that you want in the model, but then you'll have to develop the various mechanics by which those inputs work. So let me give you an example. Let's take something simple that we can all relate to like networks, okay? We know that in networks there's a high level of transitivity, right? The friend of my friend has a higher probability of becoming my friend because, because of the triad, for example. So that's the mechanic by which transitivity works. Now, you can apply different inputs to, you can say, uh, the input input uh, parameter for the number of friends that each friends will connect with you can you can make it so that um, the nodes are running into into each other stochastically and uh, and if, if it so happens uh, that two nodes are connected together the, the third node connects at a high probability right there are multiple ways by which you can so you know code transitivity into a network agent based model yep. okay so when you come to, let's say that your model is made up only of one input, which is transitivity, mm -hmm. okay, you will still have to develop all the different mechanical ways by which transitivity occurs for the user in the background. So the, the user can pick whether transitivity exists or not, but you're gonna have to figure out how that actually works in the model because the user won't know how to do that. Yeah. Does that make sense? No, it does. Yeah, no, no, that does make sense. Okay. So, um, I was thinking a completely different direction. The list that you've got right here is a list that you, with all of your experience, have generated as potential inputs. Okay. And I, I, so I would just live with that. There is a fascinating dissertation to be written to tell me to which of those 10 inputs these outputs are the most sensitive and which, it, which don't make a difference. Uh, when you populate it with the closest you can come up with to real world data from a real world case situation. Um, because I'll guarantee you there's going to be differential sensitivities across that, those 10 inputs. And one or two of them is going to make absolutely no difference. It's always going to be the case. Could be that one or two of them would be the only ones that make a difference. Yeah. And then you're back to something you had in much, much, one of your much earlier slides. You're testing what are your hypotheses are. Because uh, you wanted these models to basically say, if you're making assertions that if I do this, that's going to happen, um, you want a model to be able to validate that so that it's more than just your expert judgment. Because yeah. we can all be wrong. Yeah. No, sorry, I'm gonna I'm gonna put my own crazy bias on this, right? So I spent an inordinate amount of energy trying to stay connected uh, inside the army instead of just disappearing away, you know, for three years. Uh, and I, I mean, unequivocally, there's a lot of discussion right now about hey, how do we leverage big data? So my so I guess back briefing you, what I would say is, hey, you know, taking that, you're taking, in effect, a model like you know, this model or, or a slight variation of that, focus on the big data tie-in, so the input and the validation aspect for dissertation. I think that's absolutely the wrong way to go. Okay. Because yeah, so. <laughs> I think how do we leverage big data is a stupid question. Uh, Who collected the big data yeah. and why was it collected? What research was that an answer to? What research question was that data collected as an answer to? Yeah. The answer is, it's random. We collected the data because we could collect the data. Yeah. So it wasn't collected for any particular research purpose. It's like we launched the Hubble telescope, the engineers control it for 10 years, they point it randomly at the sky, hand the data to the astronomer and say, what can you tell me about the universe? Now, make sure you use all this data. This is not the way science is done. You know, you, yeah. you, you collect data to answer a question. Now, you could take a specific big data set that may require some big data techniques and try and apply that as an input to your model. In which case, maybe your big data set is, uh, I mean, IQ gets all this real world information, I mean, that's a big data set. And, there may be some mining that could be applied, in which case you have a, you have a big data set that has been um, methodologically kind of pulled off of the internet based on timestamps and stuff. So that kind of approach could give you a big data set to play with, but to just say big data, whatever we grab. Le it's leveraging not big help. data is, uh, is, is, should not be a goal. Well, Ken, I, I uh, that's understand, my, I understand yeah, your point of view and I respect yes, your point of view, sweet. but the fact of the matter is, a 
lot of the data that are available were collected by somebody because they could. They did not have a purpose in mind. They did not have a question in mind. And in, in some cases, that was actually mandated by a federal agency. If you collect, you don't analyze. If you analyze, you don't collect, because we want to keep the, the collection pure, untainted by anybody's biases. Even when data were collected for one purpose, they often turn out to be potentially useful for another. So we always have the problem of what can we do with a data set that may or may not address the question we now want to answer. But if we so fashion we our doctoral dissertations such that they have to use big data that someone else collected, I mean, that's, that's uh, I, I just think that's, that's, that's fallacious. The data should not be the reason we're doing research. The data should not be the reason we're asking questions. We're asking questions because we have to set resource allocation policies in, in, in a country that's broke, ours, uh, you know, and we can't do everything. So we have to decide, we have to prioritize what we do when we deploy, uh, when we spend literally blood and treasure. And, 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 you know, I'm sorry that the big mom and dad back home who put their son or daughter at risk don't really care how much big data you use. <laughs> well, no, that's it. So that, I mean, that becomes kind of like a, another aspect of this, right? So at 692, we're looking at, at Libya right now, right? So, and that, that's the question is how do you understand what's going on when you when you have nothing, right? Like, uh, you know, you just have spent a lot of time looking at that, right? It's, it's uh, uh, you know, uh, like the World Bank is putting out you know, reports based off data from 2005 before the revolution even occurred, right? So, so, you know, from that perspective is how can the analysts say, well, based off these things that I'm seeing, you know, can I get a better sense by, by using a model of probably what's going on or have a more rigorous hy tested hypothesis of what I think is going on in there because I can recreate it in here when I say, well, this factor matters more than this one. Well, Does that make sense? Okay, yes, what yeah. you said makes absolute sense, yeah. but you, you didn't start with a purpose of using big data. You started yeah, yeah, because no. now I, this data is incidental to my investigation. Yeah. I can use it for a validation purpose. That makes sense. Okay, I can yeah. understand. No, that. yeah. This is, see, this and is, validation this is becomes yeah. more possible Fights when you good. have yeah. a, a, a big data with, which, which you can dock with. Yeah. But um, now you're putting the court card actually behind the horse. Yeah. So, so um, are you? Are you oh, sorry. Are you thinking of doing an experiment? Um, with analysts to give them this at the end of this? Well, so th I mean, that would be the, I think that would probably be, I, I don't know, so you, I mean, you, you know, so better than me, but that'd be a, a horribly, or a, not horribly, but that'd be a different take on dissertation usually come out here. So I'd come up, like say, take that as a toy model with inputs, but then my dissertation might focus on their ability to apply it uh, and how well they think it helped them. I or think it might be thinking. part of your dissertation. Yeah. It might not be the focus, but it would be, I mean, if you're concerned, that's really a big, big problem in the Army is intelligence preparation of the battlefield, RTB, yeah. and that's a constraint that you can use, and you can get, there's all sorts of case studies, clearly mm -hmm. historical and current, and so I, I think it would be really interesting as a, kind of the, end activity to give this and either have it just a subjective you know assessment or a more rigorous assessment mm. and it's so, been done before very successfully i think steve scott uh, wrote his on fisheries yeah, management and, and where they the yeah. took the models and and uh, worked on developing the models with the fishery yeah i think that's a good potential yeah. approach kind of to, to get get about it uh, well, just some online comments real quick oh, yeah. that have been coming through uh, so one comment uh, from a tactical improvement, someone did recommend to uh, include GIS in, yeah. in your model. Yeah. But I think you, uh, also, so uh, on the debate between data, um, so the comment is Rob's, Rob Axtell, for those of us who are new here, Rob Axtell, he's using big data for the economic model that he's built, the, the 120 million agent yeah. model. Yeah. Um, but he's fitting it into a theoretical perspective to structure and validate his model. So you can still yes. use big data. Yeah, yeah, yeah just, no, that would be, right? yeah. yeah. And then yeah. another yeah, comment. Yeah, that would be assumption, yeah. And yeah. then another yeah. comment so that the online people don't feel left out. Yeah. Um, is using a local conflict and uh, using local conflicts, which echoes uh, the earlier, demonstrating how it scales up to a larger conflict and how the model affects or can help anticipate decisions, threats, and opportunities. So that's also something that you could include. Yeah. That's good. I got to highlight. So let me uh, 
highlight something that I think is underlying some of what Ken was saying. So when you start out with a modeling project, generally you should have a question in mind. You're trying to answer a question. You're trying to understand a phenomenon. You're trying to improve something. Um, if So to that end, Rob's model is trying to understand the economy, understand what levers uh, affect what outputs. And so that, that guides what data he's looking for and how he wants to use it. Um, it's different from saying, here's an enormous blob of data to go yeah, do something. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah. Uh, so wait, this is, more broadly, I think this is applicable to what you're doing here. Uh, it seems that you've taken three sub-models that, are there existing agent-based models for these different sub-models? Yes. Models? Yeah. And so the, the one that incorporates, except for conflict onset, is Sempro, uh, but there's some other ones uh, that are out there that, that incorporate the same two, the cooperative uh, game theory, non-cooperative game theory, for applying different other things, like uh, variance and climate change, all right, with that, and how does that affect using those two? But it, uh, my impression is that at Claremont, that those two aspects of the CBO and stakeholder are, are, have have been validated uh, through whatever work that they've done out there. I've only read a couple of those papers, uh, and, and many of the students are able to apply it uh, under different variations to other, to other aspects. Okay, so taking three existing models and uh, combining them. Mm -hmm. No, they so those two already, um, except for the conflict on uh, onset. Uh, you may have done that in the climate change, but the CBO and stakeholder have been paired and used in several models. From my understanding. Okay. Yeah. So perhaps a, a good way to structure your thinking about this is say, what are the questions that they were able to answer with these individual models? Yeah what were they able to answer by pairing them together? What questions can then I address if I add this third piece in? Okay, yep. Yeah. And you know, let's go back to the online comment, which is add, add geo, and you're not as you had, oh, that's great, now we now all know how to put geo into a, into a um, logo model, and that's great. But I think a very interesting research question is that's that's a twelfth input of the ten or whatever. Does it make a difference? You get different results if you put geo than if you have just stars on a map here. Um, if the answer is no, you're saving a whole lot of people a whole lot of time. All right. Well, uh, thank you all very much. Hopefully, so hopefully it wasn't a horrible waste of your Friday afternoon on Good Friday. All right. Um, but no, I think this was this is extremely beneficial for me. So I take it as a win. All right. Um, but yeah, if there's any questions or comments, I mean, I'm only in my second semester, so I got I got at least another year of of um, uh, of coursework to do, and then I'll hopefully move on to my dissertation phase, where, where I'm trying to right now. This uh, ideology histogram over there yes so this data that is generated from a normal distribution yeah and then you can set the uh, yeah they could so you you set the mean and the standard deviation so you can skew it even though the the it, okay so, so that's that's how off, I purposely skewed it I, I have to scold you slightly skewing when you're talking about a statistical distribution has nothing to do with the mean or standard deviation yeah. it has to do with Tilting it so there's more mass on this side or more mass on this side. Yeah. It's the third moment. Yes. And the fourth moment. Uh, second, there's a little blob down here on your histogram at zero, which. That's not an input. That's an output of the model. I know. Yeah. Okay. He generated a, a data sample from a normal distribution and it has wrapped around to zero, is what this looks like. I mean, you've got a program no, here. This ideology histogram. Oh, is that is ideology a graph of the ideology? Yeah, input? it's it's how people are how their ideologies are. No, it's not the input; it's the output. 
Yeah. Yes. Yeah. What is this? So that, that's probably going to be your government stakeholders. That's your yeah. most likely. Okay, that's so your one percent selectorate. That, that's, yeah. that's that's well, that's yeah. emergent. That's not. That's yeah, that's, that's emergent for the fact that you have the people that still want the government to be in charge. But that's that's are their ideologies changing. Variable, yes. Right? Yeah, their ideologies change. Okay. Right, based off their interaction, based off who's within their pox band. Okay, so you sampled some from this distribution, and you've sampled some from this distribution. Right. Well, no, so that's no, because okay. I mean, yeah, they, I mean, they're aging. Tom, yeah. Tom, that's that is not that, we're not that that output is not a representation of sampling from two random variables. It's an emergent from the entire model. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And and that looks about right for those of us who they deal a lot with complexity, uh, bimodal distributions, Harlow distributions. Uh, exponential distributions are very common in, in these like weird like, models. That's not even that. bimodal. That's basically a mixture of populations portrayed on Instagram. <coughs> the, the, the point is that's not based yeah. on a, on th any kind of combination between any two random variables that are normally distributed. That's an emergent output from the whole model. Okay. So we don't actually know what's in there. <laughs> okay, I, I got the impression that he was generating. No, 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 uh, yeah, no. That's that goes into the agents. From that, the distribution. that sets the no, agents' no. distribution is based off the interaction. So that's what comes out over time. But thank you, Tom. Yeah, I appreciate it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So this is all good in development. Sure. Thank you, Bill. I raised my voice so. No, no, it's, yeah, no, it's all good. If I didn't want those shots, I wouldn't. I'm, I'm, I'm amazed. I've never seen Ken get excited before.